This lecture is entitled Imaging of Cleft Lip and Palate, and it is adapted from a presentation that was shown as an educational exhibit at the RSNA meeting in 2014, and then was published as a radiographics manuscript in 2015. I'll start off by giving a little background on cleft lip and palate. I'll briefly talk about the embryology of these conditions and I'll discuss imaging both prenatally and postnatally. Prenatal imaging, of course, involves making of the diagnosis as well as looking for associated anomalies. In postnatal imaging, the diagnosis is clinically evident, so imaging is helpful for, again, looking for associated anomalies as well as secondary deformities, and I'll explain what that means in this lecture. And then at the end, I'll summarize the key points. So as with a lot of conditions in the oral cavity, the diagnosis is made clinically. So why is imaging important? Well, two main reasons. One, with imaging, you can make the diagnosis prenatally, which gives the family and the physician time to prepare prior to delivery. And you can also detect associated abnormalities that may not be visible clinically. Cleft lip with or without cleft palate is a distinct entity from isolated cleft palate. Cleft lip with or without cleft palate is more common. It's more frequent in males. It's not frequently associated with a genetic syndrome. And interestingly, the cleft lip is more common on the left. Isolated cleft palate, on the other hand, doesn't have that gender distribution, and it is more likely associated with a genetic syndrome. A cleft lip can be unilateral or bilateral, and it can be complete or incomplete. A complete cleft of the lip is a process that involves a cleft through the lip and alveolar process that extends through the nasal sill, which is the inferior aspect of the nares. And an incomplete cleft will just involve part of those structures, typically the part of the lip, part of the alveolus, but does not extend through the nasal floor. And then, of course, as I've alluded to, a cleft lip can occur with or without cleft palate. Here are two diagrams demonstrating a unilateral cleft lip and palate shown on the left and a bilateral cleft lip and palate shown on the right. The image on the left of the unilateral cleft lip and palate separates the alveolar arches and the palate into two segments, a smaller segment termed the lesser segment and the larger segment termed the greater segment. And I think these terms are actually very useful in radiology reports as opposed to talking about the side which is ipsilateral or contralateral to the cleft, just use the terms greater segment and lesser segment. When there is a bilateral cleft lip and palate, it separates the palate into what's termed the secondary palate and the primary palate. Another term for the primary palate is the premaxilla. So you could refer to this segment as the premaxillary segment or the primary palate. So here's a focal diagram of the cephalad portion of an embryo at four weeks of gestation. Uh, which is just before the fusion of the maxillary process of the first pharyngeal arch and the frontal nasal process. So what I'm referring to here is the maxillary process, which is part of the first pharyngeal arch and the frontal nasal process here. And if you get failure of fusion here, you end up with a cleft lip. Shown here is a diagram demonstrating the closure of the secondary palate due to the elevation of the palatal shelves. This occurs at around six to eight weeks of gestation. The dotted lines represents the floor of the mouth and the outline of the tongue. And you can see how the tongue could get in the way of elevation and closure of the palatal shelves. And in some causes of cleft palate, this is what is thought to be going on. Okay.
On to imaging. Here's a coronal ultrasound image in a fetus at 22 weeks of gestation showing a unilateral cleft lip. And let me just orient you here. Right here is the lower lip, and you have the upper lip with the cleft on the left side. And then I'd like you to see the nose, which is right here, and the two nostrils here and here. And you can see that this cleft goes all the way up into the nose, likely representing a complete unilateral cleft. Here's an axial ultrasound image of a fetus at 22 weeks of gestation, showing evidence of a bilateral cleft lip with a protrusive premaxillary segment. So here's the protrusive premaxillary segment, which can sometimes just look at like an echogenic mass and would carry a differential. But if you have enough images in different planes, you can tell that this is a bilateral cleft lip with a premaxillary segment. And the other thing you can note is or are these two echogenic foci? These are developing tooth buds within the premaxillary segment. Here is an ultrasound, 3D ultrasound image of a fetus with a cleft lip. And again, you can see that's a left sided cleft lip, probably complete as it appears to extend to the nasal floor. Shown here is an axial fetal MR image of a fetus at 32 weeks of gestation showing a cleft of the maxillary alveolus. Here is the alveolar arch and here and here's the cleft. Here's just an example of what a bilateral cleft lip and palate might look like on MRI. You can see on this T2 sequence, there's disruption of the arch and there's the protruding premaxillary segment with developing tooth buds. And you also don't see a palate, which may be better demonstrated on this midline sagittal sequence. This patient had wolf hirschhorn syndrome with a cleft lip and palate, an absent kidney and a triangular shaped face. But what I'm trying to show you here on this coronal sequence is this encephalocele. In addition to looking for the associated anomalies, it's really important to evaluate for secondary deformities, that is deformities that occur as a consequence of the cleft lip and or palate. So these include missing or supernumerary teeth, otitis media, the tightest media results from the abnormal palatal musculature and palatal soft tissues, which, which results in poor drainage from the middle ear. Oronasal fistula can occur, and this is typically not only as a result of the cleft, but also of the attempts at repair. Velopharyngeal insufficiency can also occur due to the shortened palate post repair, and this is when the Soft palate cannot close off the nasopharyngeal airway and it results in hypernasal speech. These patients also have hypoplastic mandibles and abnormal palatal musculature, which can lead to a tendency of the airway to collapse and result in obstructive sleep apnea. And then the patients also have hypoplastic maxillas as a result of the cleft, but also most commonly as a result of the palatal repair, particularly early palatal repairs. This 3DC reconstruction of the soft tissues of a patient with a left unilateral cleft lip demonstrates one of the primary uh, dentofacial deformities associated with cleft lip, and that is widening and inferior displacement of the alar base on the side that is ipsilateral to the cleft right here. This is a panoramic radiograph of a nine-year-old boy with bilateral cleft lip and palate. This patient is in the mixed dentition, so they have permanent and primary teeth present. And there's a lot going on here 
it would be difficult to know exactly what's occurring here, but you should know that there's an asymmetric eruption pattern. There are things on the left that maybe aren't quite on the right. There's these kind of small tooth looking structures here. There's kind of a density over there that probably represents tooth structure that doesn't have an exact correlate on the other side. And so again, there could be retained primary teeth, missing teeth, extra teeth. It's hard for you to know exactly what's going on, but to at least be able to recognize that there's an asymmetric eruption pattern and make the appropriate referral to a dental specialist would be, would be good. So if the patient is referred early to the dentist, the patient can have a, a pretty good cosmetic outcome. And typically the treatment involves braces by an orthodontist and an alveolar bone graft to the cleft prior to the eruption of the canine. And that's because if the canine erupts into the cleft, it'll lose its periodontal support and become unsalvageable. The lateral incisor is often unsalvageable, and that's because it may be missing or malformed or just right in the middle of the cleft and there's nothing they can do. This patient, I can't remember if the patient had a missing or unsalvageable left lateral incisor, but an implant was placed in the alveolar bone graft within the cleft, which allowed for a good cosmetic result. Here is a midline sagittal CT image in a 10-year-old girl with a repaired cleft lip and palate. And you can see there's a persistent oronasal fistula. And that's right at the junction of the primary and secondary palates, noted by the arrow. Here are sagittal and axial CT sections of a male adolescent with Apert syndrome who had clefting of the soft and hard palate and a severe mid-face hypoplastic deformity. Again, these patients, they may be relatively prognathic in the mandible, but their mandibles are also hypoplastic. And as a combination of the abnormal palatal soft tissues as well as the mandibular retrognathism or hypoplasia, the airway is often small. So you can see here on the sagittal section, the tongue appears to be more posterior and appears to be narrowing the oropharyngeal airway. And again, this is also demonstrated on axial section with a narrowed oropharyngeal airway. Here's a lateral cephalometric radiograph of a patient who had a history of a cleft lip and palate, had it repaired, and then ultimately had maxillary hypoplasia. So you can see the relatively posterior position of the maxilla relative to the mandible. But remember, again, the mandible is not prognathic. It's relative prognathism, but the mandible is either normal or often hypoplastic as well. But more prominent is the maxillary hypoplasia. And you can see that there is poor support to the upper lip and the nose is downturned. And on the right now is a, a different patient who had the same history of cleft lip and palate and then had a Lefort 1 osteotomy and advancement of the maxilla. And again, this is the different patient. It's not the same patient post-operative, but you can certainly see the more normal relationship of the maxilla and the mandible and the improved support to the upper lip and the tip of the nose. Here are two lateral cephalometric radiographs of a 14-year-old girl with Stickler syndrome who had repair of an isolated cleft palate. She developed obstructive sleep apnea likely as a result of the mandibular hypoplasia associated with her condition as well as the maxillary hypoplasia from her underlying syndrome as well as from the palatal repair. And the difference between these two radiographs is that the one on the right, the patient is protruding her jaw, her lower jaw, the mandible. And you can see the mandible is in a more anteriorly positioned location on the image on the right. And look at the difference in the caliber of the airway. So this again just demonstrates the importance of mandibular size and mandibular position in maintaining the oropharyngeal airway. Here's a patient with a history of right cleft lip and palate 
who after multiple surgical repairs had velopharyngeal insufficiency. And you can note the very short soft palate right here. And you can imagine how that may not be able to elevate and fully close off the nasopharynx during speech. So again, to summarize, cleft lip and isolated cleft palate are distinct entities. Cleft palate can be difficult to detect at ultrasound. You'll notice that the cases I showed you on ultrasound were all of cleft lip, which is fairly easy to detect. If there's suspicion for cleft palate, a fetal MRI can be obtained. And postnatal imaging, again, can assist in identifying associated abnormalities as well as secondary deformities. Patients with cleft lip and palate may appear to have mandibular prognathism, but they often have retrognathism of both the maxilla and the mandible, or another word to say that it's hypoplasia of the maxilla and the mandible with a relative prognathism of the lower jaw. And I want to just go over what the secondary deformities are and the secondary sequelae of a cleft lip and or palate so that you can kind of have an eye out for them when you're looking at imaging studies of patients with this history. These patients are set up to get recurrent otitis media due to abnormal drainage of the middle ear. Dental anomalies are almost always present. Oral nasal fistula can result from the attempts at repair. Velopharyngeal insufficiency also results from repair attempts in the underlying deformity and this results in hypernasal speech. And obstructive sleep apnea, again related to the abnormal palatal musculature as well as the hypoplastic mandible. And then maxillary hypoplasia, which is often a cosmetic concern for these patients.